Friday, August the 7th, 1998. Two men in a delivery truck set off from a suburb of the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. In the back, 1,600 pounds of explosives. Forty-five minutes later, the truck pulls up at the rear entrance of the United States Embassy. symbol of American power in Africa is no more. Over 200 people were killed, thousands more injured. Three years before 9-11, this was Osama bin Laden's first major strike in his jihad, his holy war against America. Hello everyone and welcome to this latest installment of the Roads to 9-11 interview series with Adam Fitzgerald. In this episode, Adam will be explaining Osama bin Laden's move into the Sudan in the 1990s, the development of Al-Qaeda, leading up to the bombings of the US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. We'll touch on the role of the double or triple agent Ali Muhammad in plotting the bombings. Look at how the apprehension of one of the perpetrators led the FBI to Al-Qaeda's Yemeni hub and begin to ask what the NSA knew and why they were unable to prevent the bombing. We'll also look at the consequences of the attacks with Bill Clinton bombing the major pharmaceutical factory in Sudan and the terrible humanitarian cost of that. Now here's Adam starting with some of the backstory. When the Soviet Afghan war ended, uh, Osama bin Laden was hailed as a hero to the Muslim community, or the Ummah, as they're called. And when the Iraqi government uh, in, invaded Kuwait in 1990 under false pretenses, the Saudi government was fearful of an invasion next. Bin Laden then went before the Sudari 7, the family line of the kingdom itself, and outlined a plan um, to spell the looming Iraqi army. He would use, he proposed that he would use the uh, the Mujahideen fighters who recently expelled um, the mighty Soviets and sent them as the country's defense. However, King Fahd uh, rejected the ludicrous motion of using Mujahideen fighters and instead asked the United States, which was a key ally to Saudi Arabia, to station 300,000 uh, U.S. soldiers on Saudi soil instead. And considering the, the Muslim community as a whole, Saudi Arabia is the holiest land in all of Islam. It's a home to the, uh, the, the, the two holy mosques. Now, Bin Laden is incensed and immediately goes to a, from an ally to the enemy of the Saudis. And when the Gulf War against Iraq ends, U.S. stations uh, approximately between 15,000 and 20,000 soldiers in Saudi Arabia permanently. He also trained the Royal Saudi Armed Forces while they were there. Uh, the Saudi government has put Bin Laden under house arrest and freezes his assets uh, for fear of a reprisal. However, in April of 91, Saudi intelligence minister Prince Turkey Al Faisal meets with Bin Laden to strike a deal which is covered in a uh, classified U.S. intelligence report, which uh, famed author Jell Posner states that the Saudis are willing to let Bin Laden free and relinquish back his assets if he relocates. Bin Laden agrees to this tentative deal, and Hassan Tarabi, uh, the leader of the National Islamic Front in the Sudan, one of the more prominent leaders of the country, uh, as an enigmatic Sunni Islamist for over 40 years, lends an invitation uh, to Bin Laden to move into the country. Um, Sudan is one of the only Arab countries on earth which allows Muslims with no visas to relocate as he wanted to show solidarity between Sunnis and Shiites. Um, meanwhile, much of Bin Laden's financial assets, which are located in the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, were lost due to the constant fraud and waste, which the bank closed its doors shortly after it came under investigation for Great Britain. Bin Laden 
um, and a small team of financial experts worked on a plan to replace the functions of the PCCI. And together they constructed a plan to open a new source of funding with the help of many international Arab businessmen, and including those of the drug trade, such as Obadine Hekmatar and, and other Saudi oil magnates. This network would replace the BCI bank and continue to become a network to help from external entities affiliated with Pakistan, Saudi mosques, and refugee centers worldwide, even inside the United States. It was here that began, Dulap began constructing roads, hospitals, and other invaluable social programs for the Sudanese. Meanwhile, Pakistan begins to expel the Mujahideen from the Peshawar border, and bin Laden exports uh, these Mujahideen to the Sudan and for their travels. Sudan now becomes the hub of most al-Qaeda activity. By the um, end of 91, the CIA begins monitoring Bin Laden's house in Khartoum, Sudan. This is the first time the CIA begins hearing more about the Saudi financier. And by 1993, Mugadishu rebels were beginning to receive guerrilla type training from senior Mujahideen Afghans who traveled with Bin Laden. Uh, Mugadishu Salafist clans began to cause civil strife and warring over territory, which was beginning to transpire within the numerous smaller cities. As the United Nations tried to intervene, they were noticeably outnumbered and outgunned, and humanitarian aid was being stolen by Mugadishu rebel forces. In July 93, the US military special forces engaged in an operation to capture or kill a prominent clan leader named uh, Muhammad Farah Adi, who was a clan of the biggest clan called the Habar Gadir. And Bin Laden had, had in the previous year, um, to the U.S. operation, began training rebels under, under the Al-Qaeda and many smaller factions in Khartoum, in Somalia. Al-Qaeda's military chief, Mohammed Atev, and Ali Mohammed, who was part of the U.S. Special Forces and allied to Omar al Khan, began training thousands of men. Um, many of these Mujahideen have previous experience from the Soviet invasion into Afghanistan in 1979 and knew how to use rocket propelled grenade weapons to shoot down helicopters. Some were skilled and knew how to knock down the, the helicopters by shooting at the propellers of these Black Hawk helicopters. I'll just pause um, you for one second, Adam, to sure. make point Ali Mohammed when you mentioned Omar Abdul Rahman. Just to link back, that's the blind sheikh who was centrally involved in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. And we have mentioned Ali Mohammed before as having involvement in training the, um, the assassins of Maya Kahani when we, when we went, talked about those videos. I'm just linking that in. And I know you're going to talk a bit more about Ali Mohammed and we'll be mentioning him a lot more in the next video. But just to link in to, to how we've mentioned him before. So, sorry to. That's, cor to yeah, that's correct. And actually, him. also, too, when they raided. Uh, uh, El Said Nocera's home, they found um, uh, manuals, uh, army training manuals and blueprints which were linked back to Ali Mohammed because he was actually in the Green Berets and the Special Forces inside the United States. Um, there was also documents uh, relating back to his uh, army base in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, we'll talk about more of him in a separate issue. Um, Bin Laden, but, but um, Bilal would later re reiterate the role of Al-Qaeda in his network during the Battle of Mogadishu to CNN's Peter Bergen in 1997, later on. And the U.S. Special Forces pulled out of Mogadishu, defeated and wounded. And with 18 U.S. Special Forces killed, there were 73 wounded in the battles over the months of 1993. But this is important because Bin Laden actually realized that the U.S. military, Special Forces itself, uh, could easily be dis dis dismayed and defeated while suffering major losses because the, the rebel losses were somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 troops. Um, but it was noted that, uh, that the U.S. Special Forces could easily, easily defeat it, even under a uh, slight attack. Um, it was this defining moment that he began thinking of taking the fight to the United States itself, to the country itself. So by 1994, February of 94, uh, Ali Mohammed begins training Bin Laden's personal bodyguard. As there was a previous attempt by Libyan militants who tried to assassinate um, Bin Laden and ended up killing 16 worshippers at a mosque that Bin Laden regularly attends. 
And also at the same time, Ali Muhammad sets up a meeting between Bin Laden and Imad Mugmiya. Imad, a short history about him, Imad Mugmiya is the security chief of Hezbollah. They discuss upcoming operations in the future. Mugmiya, who, by the way, was affiliated with the hijacking of uh, EWA Flight A-47 and also of Air India Jet 1999, incidentally, where the passengers would be exchanged for one Omar Saeed Sheikh who would be a pay courier later on to Muhammad Atta, who was part of 9-11. Um, in 1993, November 90, shortly after the Battle of Mogadishu, Bin Laden, competent, fresh off the Battle of Mogadishu, then uh, tells Ali Muhammad to scout out possible targets relating to uh, British, French, Israeli, U.S. interests in Nairobi, Kenya. So Muhammad begins surveilling numerous buildings in Kenya and Tanzania, taking photographs of embassies, banks, other high-value targets. He then later comes back and he proceeds to show Bin Laden two U.S. embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and in Nairobi, Kenya. Meanwhile, U.S. intelligence services begin to monitor Ali Muhammad while in Khartoum. And in late 1994, um, FBI agents discovered that Ali Muhammad is temporarily living in an Al-Qaeda safe house in Nairobi and have his house in San Francisco at the same time monitored as well. Um, in late 1995, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was the nephew to Ramzi Youssef involved with the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Visits Bin Laden in the Sudan. Yeah, visit, he visits Bin Laden in the Sudan. So I'm just saying he's the uncle of... I'm sorry, yes, the uncle, you. thank you. Yeah, he's the uncle of Ramzi Youssef. Uh, this is the first time these two meet, and it's very important because these are the first time these two meet together. Also, at that same year, Bin Laden writes an open letter to King Fahd of Saudi Arabia and calls for a campaign of guerrilla attacks to drive out U.S. forces out of the kingdom. And then, some in 1996, he commits to his first fatwa uh, with the World Islamic Front. This is with Ibn Zawahiri, another prominent. Islamist Salafist uh, Mujahideen um, leaders, in that he calls for the elimination of the military in Saudi Arabia and to kill um, U.S. military, but to leave uh, citizens alone, U.S. citizens alone. This would change, however, in the future. And in February of 98, Bin Laden and the World Islamic Front hold a press conference and issues a fatwa titled the... Um, the International Islamic Front for Jihad Against Jews and Crusaders. And sitting beside Bin Laden is his closest ally, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad leader, Ayman Zawahiri, while the second in command of the Al-Qaeda military, Mohammed Atta, is sitting at his right. And the fatwa is to kill any and all Americans wherever you find them. And in May of 98, Bin Laden holds another interview, this time with ABC's uh, John Miller, where in the background of where Bin Laden is sitting is uh, a map and where it shows the cities where he's preparing an attack for Kenya and Tanzania. He later comes out and says that uh, this is the case. Um, meanwhile, in preparing for the U.S. Embassy's attack, um, Mohammed Ode, a Saudi engineer, begins supervising the construction of two very large 2,000-pound devices. Um, and the explosives themselves were packed into 20 specifically designed wooden crates that were sealed and then placed in the bed of the two trucks that are going to be used. Um, but it took months to prepare the devices and construct them properly. And they didn't want a repeat of the 93 World Trade Center bombing. The bombs weren't built big enough. These bombs were a little bit bigger. Meanwhile, an Egyptian named Mustafa Mahmoud, uh, said that um, a driver named Akna would tell the C he would go into the CIA station, employees uh, in Nairobi, and tell them of the impending attack in Nairobi and Kenya. And he knows about the intimate details of the plot because he was part of the team. Now he mentions this. Uh, he mentions intricate details that only that insiders would know, and he would inform them about the plot. But the CIA dismisses him as having fabricated the plot and has Ahmed deported back to Egypt. Um, now this would lend uh, credence that 
Um, there was conspiracies that the FBI or the CIA knew about the attacks and alluded to them. But there's not much in the way of factual information mm -hmm. relating to that. But that was the closest that would come. And that it would later come out to be true that Mustafa Mahmoud was part of the uh, operation, but that he went into the Egyptian CIA Egyptian embassy. But the CIA actually um, dismisses his information. Now, whether, now, of course, now this would lead to speculation that the CIA. Uh, wanted this attack to happen, but that, like I said, I don't really like speculation, so I'm going to leave it at that, if you don't mind. But meanwhile, Ali Muhammad would meet with FBI agents in the United States and tell them of his background with bin Laden and Omar Abdel Rahman, and even hints about an upcoming plot in East Africa, I mean, in North Africa. But Jack Clooney, who had dinner with him, he's head of the I-49 squad tracking Al-Qaeda, while he's interviewing, but, but no action is taken against Mali Mohammed. He doesn't arrest him or anything because he's actually a triple agent at this point. He's an agent for the FBI. He's an agent for the CIA. He's also an agent for the, the Islamic, Islamic Jihad, you know, Madar Rahman. On August 7th, 1998, between the time of 10.30 and 10.40 a.m., a martyrdom operative was driving these two trucks which had the bombs placed in the back of the vehicles, parked outside the embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in Nairobi, Kenya. And they simultaneously detonate. And approximately 213 people are killed in Nairobi, with 4,000 wounded. In the Dar es Salaam operation, 11 were killed and 85 were wounded. The driver of the truck used in Nairobi, only known as his, his name is Azam, had stopped at the guard gate that, well, Muhammad Rashid, uh, Muhammad Rashid uh, Aoud al, al Hawali, I won't say that again, <laughs> was, was in the passenger seat of the truck. And he gets out. So here, meanwhile, the security guard, his name is um, uh, Benson Akuku, uh, uh, Wakuku. Uh, I'm, no, I'm, I'm butchering his name. Meanwhile, he's approaching the truck and was warned by Azam, opened the gate immediately, sensing something was going to happen. Um, Al Hawali throws a stun grenade and he runs away from the truck. Later on, Bin Laden will say that this was part of the operation, but he was going to use the gun that he leaves in the truck hmm. to shoot at the guard so he could kill him and he could drive further inside the compound. But he doesn't do that. He just drive. He leaves. He leaves the truck and leaves the gun behind. Sensing this, Azam and that's he detonates the device. I thought it's interesting. Um, or while he's, if I'm saying his name right, is just as an interesting aside. What I read about his reason for running away okay like the, the 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 guess i would have made was that he got scared because the bomb was going to run off and he realized that he couldn't get the gates open right. and his account apparently was that he there's a fine line between being a martyr and committing suicide and when he realized he'd left his gun and he played no further useful role in the operation had he died he wouldn't have died a martyr he would have died as a suicide which is a terrible sin and he wouldn't have gone to heaven then so he had to run away i think that's just it was for me an interesting insight into the fundamentalist mentality that's driving that, people i would agree i agree with that whole lot because that's how i initially put however in bin laden in a later in the interview with john miller he states off camera that um and not not john miller um he states uh, i'm sorry peter bergen of cn he tells him that that was going to be the case that a while he was supposed to survive the operation, but what he was supposed to do was kill the, uh, the guard at the gate so that he could drive further inside the compound, which would have probably caused a lot bigger. And meanwhile, the, I mean, the death total was high, but that would have been much higher because the bomb was so powerful. Um, but Hawali was supposed to live, but Hawali, Hawali had numerous injuries to his back and his arm because he runs away as the blast was occurring. He goes to the, he goes, well, he, he went to the hospital to tend to his wounds. The doctors were suspicious. And on August 12th, um, a while he is arrested and immediately confesses his role to the bombing. And he cooperates openly with the, uh, the FBI immediately. You know, like, he didn't have to be tortured. He gives them a number he called previously uh, before the bombing and after. And it belonged to a safe house in Yemen, which I will get into. A, just a little bit. That's going to be very important. This number. Uh, now, uh, later on, a uh, while he's lawyers later claim in his defense 
that the reason for the bombing was a harsh economic sanctions against Iraq in the 1990s, much in the way of what Bin Laden states in other interviews as well. Even play um, video clips of Madela by who said that the, this, the deaths of half a million Iraqi children were worth it. Um, on August 20th, 1998, U.S. President Bill Clinton orders a military strike titled um, Operation uh, Infinite Reach, which consists of numerous missile strikes on targets in the Sudan and Afghanistan. Um, warship stationed in the Red Sea uh, fired uh, approximately, I think, uh, 10 to 13 missiles at the Sudan's Al Shifa pharmaceutical factory. Um, which the U.S. claimed was where Bin Laden was building chemical weapons, where he uh, wanted to build a nuclear facility as well. The, the factory's owner, Salah Idris, denies that the factory had any link to such um, weapons or any terrorist group whatsoever. In 96, later on, in, in 2006, it would later come out that uh, a, senior, a CIA analyst named Mary McCarthy was against the, the bombing of the factory, and even written a formal letter of protest to Bill Clinton due to the fact that there was absolutely zero evidence mm. that there was a chemical plant for Al-Qaeda being built there. Um, it would later be asserted that the bombing of the plant was to detract the negative attention that Bill Clinton was getting during the Monica Lindsay scandal, yeah. um, a, um, a magnetic theory, if you will. Um, but the U.S. State Department would hand down these indictments against the people charged with bombing, and they included um, Osama bin Laden, Ahmed Zawahiri, Mohammed Atef, um, Ali Dal Hajj, and of course, Mohammed Sadek Odeh, and uh, 15 to 16 others. And a year following the bombing, the FBI would investigate further to find that, um, incidentally, the Egyptian and Islamic Jihad were probably behind the embassy bombings and not Al Qaeda. So Al Qaeda operatives in Afghanistan, meanwhile, they would evacuate their training camps because there was. Military was bombing the camps there, and the NSA began tracking the large satellite phone in Khartoum back in '91. And this is going to be important because what happens is that they took notice of a number he called the most. And this is going. What I'm saying is that they were tracking the satellite phone all the way back in '91, and that the number he was calling the most, which was a safe house in Yemen, which I stated earlier, mm -hmm. which was owned by one Ahmed El Haddad. And who is Hakim al Hadda, an associate of Bin Laden from the 1979 Soviet Afghan War, and the father of one, the father-in-law, one Khalid al Hadar, who will have a much more important role in the future for 9/11. At this point in 1998, the NSA now begins to wiretap the Yemeni safe house, which would turn out to be the main hub of all Al-Qaeda calls and activities, 1998. So I'll leave it at the end of there and why it's very important and which this will have future ramifications for 9-11 in the future. Okay, thank you, Adam. I would just like to return for a bit to, to the bombing of the Al-Shifa pharmaceutical Please. factory, just to mention the implications of that. Okay, so it certainly wasn't ever demonstrated that there were any chemical weapons being produced there. Um, but you know, you might think in a Western country, if a pharmaceutical factory was destroyed, we just buy our pharmaceuticals from elsewhere, and the price might go up slightly. But the economic impact is much more harshly felt in a country like Sudan, where they can't necessarily afford to import malaria drugs and such, and the estimations of deaths go run into the tens of thousands as a result of that bombing, which is a terrible thing in and of itself, but also confirmed the Islamic radicals in their perspective that they were fighting this demon in the West then. Right. This, this in very much in a way is uh, similar to a previous incident in which where um, U.S. missiles, uh, U.S. military warships bomb uh, pharmaceutical plants and food stations in Iraq, southern, southern Iraq, in which it, it affected, of course, obviously, uh, millions of people, and which 500,000 children ultimately died of starvation, uh, poor medical, um, uh, poor medical uh, 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 health, uh, 
poor medical health uh, adversaries were, were, were not being properly uh, administered to the two children and to the elderly, and that's who suffered most from mm -hmm. it. Much in the way of Sudan, in which you know, the CIA actually knew that there wasn't any type of link with uh, Al Qaeda building a chemical factory. And it comes out later, uh, like I said previously, that the uh, CIA reports under Mary McCarthy that there was no evidence that they were building a hub. But I think this was uh, um, an issue with the State Department where they said, well, we'll just bomb the factory itself because they allowed uh, a Saudi terrorist financier to live inside the country. But who suffers the most from this? It goes back to your point, citizens, of course. Um, I would assume there's no um, uh, direct uh, uh, number of how many people were affected by the bombing of the Sparta Sumer's factory, but because it was built in such a poor area of, of uh, uh, the Sudan, I would assume tens of thousands, maybe even 100 to 150,000. But like I said, who suffers the most from it? Children and the elderly. And I think that uh, I agree with the wag the dog field is that in order to deflect away from the attention that Bill Clinton was getting with Monica Lewinsky, that they bombed this uh, factory, which they knew had no links to Bin Laden. Okay, well, thank you. We might, I mean, maybe it's a good point to end on that because we're going to go into next time, particularly we're going to go into like the really deep questions about who this character Ali Muhammad is and the concept of double and triple agents and US foreknowledge about these kind of events, whether they're used and all, the, all these kind of questions are inextricably linked to the person of Ali Muhammad. So we're going off the deep end next time of that. So is it a good point to end here for this time? And uh... Yes, absolutely. I think this will blend, blend right in with Ali Muhammad. Okay. Looking forward to that one. Thank you very much for today, Adam. Thank you very much for having me.